All right. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, it's wonderful to have uh, Professor Young Kasakia with us today. Uh, I imagine I imagine I invite my uh, academic advisor to uh, visit Princeton. I never imagine I invite my academic grandfather <laughs> to visit Princeton. And you can feel how much stress I have. It's like like your academic grandfather is checking your homework here. <laughs> but thanks for everyone for being here. Um, uh, and I'll introduce Professor John Kazakian briefly. Uh, Professor Kazakian received his bachelor's and master's and PhD degree from MIT and spent two years at Navy, US Navy, before returning to uh, MIT as a professor. Uh, and then since then, he has a, a glorious career, starting the founded the uh, IEEE Polytonic Society, which representing US uh, in the European polytonics uh, communities, uh, has uh, started 40, 42 volts power architecture for electric vehicles before Tesla was founded. Uh, that was like a couple of years before Tesla was talking about electric vehicles. He's already thinking about electric vehicles and trends, generation and generations of polytonics engineers, including, including me. Uh, and what's more important, uh, John actually grew up in northern uh, New Jersey. Uh, so he was familiar with the, this area and this is his first time uh, visiting Princeton. So without too much delay, uh, I will give the stadium to, to John. Uh, th thank you for that nice introduction, Minji. Um, yes, I grew up in northern New Jersey at the end of the New Jersey Turnpike <laughs> in a little town called Richfield Park. Um, but I had never been to Princeton. And I still hadn't been to Princeton until yesterday. Uh, and, and I had been looking forward to coming to Princeton. Uh, and uh, when I got into the car at Newark, I was very pleased to see that the car headed south um, towards Princeton <laughs> because I had another experience uh, about a place that I really was excited to visit many years ago, which was New Orleans. And I got a call, um, the chemical company down there needed some help. Uh, and they said, would you be able to come down uh, as a consultant and help us out with this big rectifier problem. And I said, where are you? And they said, uh, New Orleans. I said, sure, I'd love to go to New Orleans. Never been there, it's one place I'd always like to go. So I fly down to New Orleans, they come to pick me up and they head west across Lake Pontchartrain. <laughs> and I look in the rear view mirror and there's New Orleans behind us. <laughs> it's extremely disappointing and we wind up in this swampland that's full of chemical plants. <laughs> a uh, little more on that story in, in, in a bit. Um, but let me start uh, by just uh, reflecting a little bit on um, an experience I had at the Franklin Institute in the during the celebration of the IEEE's centennial. I was invited down uh, to give a talk uh, about how power electronics and the power system uh, might evolve in the future. And that night before uh, my talk, I was watching the news. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Franklin Institute. It's basically a museum. Right? It's a wonderful place. If you've never been there, you should go. Anyway, uh, they were interviewing this seven-year-old boy who uh, had been looking at the, uh, the exhibits. And he had been screwing around with a Van de Graaff generator, right? And his hair stood up on end. Um, he obviously had hair, so it stood up on end. And uh, the interviewer um, asked him, uh, the interviewer asked him, hmm. oops, giving it away. The interviewer asked him, uh, why is your hand standing up? And he said, electricity. And the interviewer then asked him, what is electricity? And the boy said, uh, I don't know, but electricity is very powerful and can do almost anything. And I thought that was really a wonderful perceptive statement from the seven-year-old. And uh, I want to add a little bit to that. Uh, you know, this was working before I connected to Glow. Um, 
it's my belief that power electronics is what makes electricity being able to do almost anything. So what I'd like to do in this talk is give you, um, first of all, those of you who are not uh, involved with power electronics, and there may be one or two of you here yes. that that applies to, just some idea of what power electronics is, um, then talk a little bit about uh, where power electronics came from, when it came there, uh, how it has evolved over the years, talk about some interesting applications, uh, briefly, no details, um, and uh, then talk a little bit about uh, my opinions about the areas that the future really uh, holds for power electronics and where efforts should be engaged uh, to push the frontiers. Uh, and then um, a couple of people asked me to talk a little bit about writing the book. Okay. Now, how many of you have the book? Well, why, why so few? <laughs> I didn't do my job. Yeah. Uh, so let, let me uh, talk about uh, power electronics. Um, what is it? Well, power electronics differs from signal electronics only in the sense that power electronics processes energy and signal electronics processes information. Uh, how they do this isn't all that dissimilar in many respects. Uh, the power levels are different. But in, in power electronics, what we do is we use switches to perform the conversion functions. And let me demonstrate why we use switches. This is a, essentially a representation of a very simple uh, power electronic circuit. Uh, it's a switch converter that will convert one DC voltage to another DC voltage, sort of. Now, the traditional way before power electronics, uh, the, the way that this was done was by putting a resistor up there where you see that switch. <clears throat> um, and in fact, after the invention of the transistor, that switch became a transistor, which is essentially a controllable resistor, and you could control the voltage V2. Unfortunately, in either of those techniques, the efficiency is dreadfully low, because if I want to go from V1 to V1 over 2, I'm dissipating half the energy in where that switch is, so the efficiency is only 50%. However, what we have here is a different problem. What we have here is a switch that in fact produces a DC voltage. Well, it produces a voltage which has a DC component, really. And what we have to do is apply filters to get that DC component out of there and into the load. And so there's a little more complexity associated with this, but the efficiency is theoretically 100%. And that's where switching power electronics really comes to the fore. So uh, where did it all start? In my opinion, the advent of power electronics started with the invention of the silicon control rectifier, the SCR, in 1957 by the engineers at GE CR&D. Um, the SCR uh, really enabled uh, some dramatic improvements in what you could do, the functions that you could perform with power electronics. Three years after the invention of the silicon controlled rectifier, GE published this book, the manual. Uh, within four years, there were um, four books devoted exclusively to the use of the SCR. So in a very short period of time, the importance of the SCR to processing energy became well known. That book, by the way, uh, was the textbook. It wasn't really a textbook, but it was all, basically the only book that was available 
that had physics and device performance and circuits and so forth that I used in the very first power electronics course that I taught at MIT. So it was stocked at the MIT bookstore. Everybody went in and bought a copy of it. Unfortunately, you have to go to uh, eBay or someplace else to buy a copy of it today. But for those of you who are interested, I really recommend that you get a copy of the GESCR manual. These other books uh, really delved in, especially the third one by Gentry Gutzwiller and Colin Yak and Ben Zostrow, uh, detailed the really physical basis of the operation of the SCR. So what could the SCR do? Um, well, what the SCR is, is essentially, it's a diode whose conduction can be delayed until you apply a signal to the third terminal. So it's what is known also as a phase controlled rectifier. So you can control the phase of conduction. So one of the first applications is in a bridge rectifier like this. And one of the great benefits of the SCR is that relative to diodes, is that you can operate this circuit in quadrant four, which is the regeneration quadrant. In other words, you can have energy moving from the DC side back to the AC side. Now, why is this important? Well, one of the applications of this bridge is to drive a DC motor. Traditionally, the way you broke a DC, right, you braked a DC motor was you threw a resistor across the, uh, the, the uh, e either the rotor or the stator, and it, energy went into the resistor. In this case, you can break the motor by driving this rectifier into mode four, into the fourth quadrant. Right? So you can actually regenerate from the motor. Now, that's good as long as the voltage across the motor doesn't go, uh, <laughs> the voltage across the motor, I'm sorry, the current across through the motor doesn't go negative. So you put a negative voltage across the motor so you can break the motor. Big change in how you control motors. One of the problems with the SCR uh, is that you can't turn it off unless the current goes to zero. So you got to bring the current down to zero. Well, that was a constraint if you wanted to make that rectifier into a motor drive that was variable frequency. So one of the uh, techniques that was proposed and actually was used extensively until the advent of the transistor uh, was proposed by uh, Bill McMurray and, and Bedford in this Bedford, uh, McMurray Bedford commutation circuit, which not only commutated the Q1, Q2 SCRs, but also returned energy back to the source because commutation of the SCRs generally required energy to be expended. Right? McMurray and Bedford came up with a scheme and that's that transformer over here, this transformer here, that enabled them to return energy to the source. Now this, you might notice uh, this problem is studied in this circuit is studied in problems 23.9 but I don't want you guys to panic because this problem is not in the second edition <laughs> of the book. Okay? So you won't be confronted with this. Um, but I want to I, I want to tell you some something else about this, about the SCR. And that is that it's got a third terminal that you can put a pulse in that turns the SCR on if, if it happens to be in the right place. Yes. Here the Q1 and Q2, that's the standard schematic, kind of a, a diode structure with that extra length. Excuse me? Uh, the standard schematic for, uh, for the FCR, is that a Q1 and Q2 in the schematic with the extra length you're referring to? Yes. Yes, yes. No, no, yes. The, these are the, no, the extra leg is over here. The, the Q1 and Q2 form <clears throat> the top and bottom uh, switches of one leg of a bridge, okay? So this is, this is one leg of a three-phase bridge, if you will. So there'd be three of these. 
you can see how complicated the circuit gets. Uh, if you really want to analyze this circuit, go to the first edition of the book, problem 23.9. And, and if you try it and you're having trouble, let me know, I'll send you the solution. <laughs> uh, look, one, one of the, uh, the traditional way of, of triggering these SCRs is by applying a pulse of current into that third terminal. Okay. But there are other mechanisms that can turn that SCR on. You can heat the SCR up. If the leakage current becomes great enough, the SCR turns on. You can apply a large DVDT between anode and cathode, and the SCR will turn on. So there are a number of different mechanisms. Some years ago, I got a call from the uh, uh, Food and Drug Administration. Uh, they had a problem with an X-ray machine. And uh, they said, could I help? And I said, well, maybe. I said, what's the problem? They said, well, this is a pediatric X-ray machine. Uh, and when they took an X-ray, the machine wouldn't turn off. Oh. Uh, that's oh. not good. Right? <laughs> so I said, well, send me the information about the machine, send me the schematic, and so forth. And it turns out that, that the way they switched the machine on and off was with a device known as a triac. Now, a triac, you can conceptually consider to be two anti-parallel SCRs. So you can construct, construct, conduct in either directions. One of the problems with the triac is that it is much more sensitive to these other triggering mechanisms that I described, DVDT and high voltage or, or temperature. Right? I didn't mention high voltage. You can turn this thing, the Q1 on, if you exceed its voltage rating as well. So I got the, the schematic and I looked at it and I saw that they were using this triac. Right? But the triac was feeding a transformer that generated the high voltage. So it was a high ratio transformer which for those of you who know anything about transformers know that such a transformer generally has a fairly substantial leakage. Now, the other feature of, of these devices is that they will not continue to conduct. The current drops below a certain minimum value, then they just shut off. What we had here in this X-ray machine was a triac, which when they turned it off, the current that was flowing in the in, in the leakage inductance, uh, when the when the triac current went down to the the level that it sort of turned, turned off, the level that it would turn off, there was still current flowing. Huge DVDT, turn the triac back on again in the other direction. So this just continued, you know, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, turn it on. The poor kid under the X-ray machine had no clue this was going on. Um, so anyway, um, we don't use those anymore. <laughs> so in 1965, RCA came out with the 2N3055. This was the first power transistor uh, that was made commercially available. This opened up a whole new um, a whole new area of application because now we had a device that you could turn on, you could turn off. And what it allowed to happen is the development of switching converters where you could control the switching, which you couldn't control with the SCR. Right? Um, subsequently to that, uh, that was in 65. Uh, in 1970, the application of the transistor had become sufficiently um, popular that there was a conference, the first conference that was devoted exclusively to power electronics. This was held down at NASA, NASA Langley uh, at the Space Flight Center. Um, and it was mostly focused on space applications, switching power supplies, relatively low power. So that conference had um, 20 papers. This is the whole conference program. 
Um, some of the main, you know, maybe you recognize some of the, the names, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, there are two papers by, where did he go? Manny Landsman, one here, uh, one up here. Uh, Manny has been a, a great um, supporter of our laboratory. Uh, he was also a teaching assistant when I was an undergraduate uh, at MIT, a very brilliant guy. Um, but the idea here is that all of these papers relate to switching converters primarily. And the application is space. In 1973, um, well, before I go there, that con that conference, the Power Conditioning Specialist Conference, evolved into what was then known as the Power Electronics Specialist Conference, or PESC. Now, some of you may have attended some PESCs. Mm -hmm. um, but in 1973, Bill Newell presented a paper at uh, the conference at PESC uh, in which he really illuminated the fact that power electronics is far more than just electronics. Power electronics involved all sorts of other disciplines. You had power electronics, you know, would supply static equipment. Power electronics would supply rotating equipment. Power electronics required control, sample data and continuous, it, uh, circuits, uh, and what's this, uh, and devices. So power electronics was essentially a family of technologies that had to be encompassed, not just, I designed this circuit. And that has persisted uh, since. This was a, really a seminal paper in power electronics. Um, I knew Bill, uh, he was at Westinghouse um, and he died uh, quite early, unfortunately. And uh, the Power Electronics Society, actually now the IEEE has a, an award in his name, uh, the Newell Award. Uh, and this coming February, Minji's mentor at MIT, Dave Perrault is gonna receive that award. So power electronics really is a system. It's not just a circuit. Uh, a lot of people don't really comprehend that. Uh, what you see here is a system where energy comes in, energy goes out, controls something, the load I've shown here is might be a machine, but who knows what it is. It could be lots of things. It could be a, it could be a microwave transmitter, it could be whatever. Um, what's missing from this picture which is critically important, and I'll dwell on it at the end, is that there is a thermal design required here. Even though I said the switches, at least the switch in the first slide, gave you 100% efficiency, you never get 100% efficiency. And as we start shrinking things, which is one of the goals of power electronics, let's shrink it, let's you know, increase the energy density, but you better increase the efficiency too, if you don't want to have the whole system dominated by a heat sink. And uh, I don't know how many of you, you, you know, taken apart an LED lamp. The major part of the LED bulb is the heat sink. And the early ones had a huge heat sink. You know, the damn thing weighed about a pound and a half because of the heat sink. And people ask, well, why do you need a heat sink? The LED is this tiny little thing. It's supposed to be so efficient. Yeah, well, the tiny little thing still dissipates heat and it's dissipating from a very tiny little place instead of, of the uh, filament on a uh, incandescent lamp. Furthermore, if it gets too hot, it doesn't work anymore, the semiconductor device. So where are the applications? And I, Mike Ronsraum, one of our former students, who's now at the University, uh, uh, Arizona State University, um, had developed this slide, uh, which I asked him if I could use because I thought it was kind of nice. It shows all the different applications. Now, a uh, couple of the applications not included here are he, he's got he's got solar, but there's no wind. 
there's no any other uh, renewable energy sources. Renewable energy really requires power electronics. Um, microgrids, distributed generation, all requires power electronics. Um, yeah, it reminds me of, a, of another application of power electronics that I ran into many years ago. Um, there's a company that was manufacturing and selling a box back in the late 70s. In the late 70s, for those of you who were around then, we had an energy crisis. Everybody was looking for ways of saving energy. I mean, one of the classics, I remember this, one of the classics on the news program one night was the governor of Vermont saying that, you know, the creative folks in Vermont had discovered this way of generating heat that you could use to heat your house. The way you would do that is you had a barrel of oil and you had a big paddle that went down in there and a motor that turned the paddle and whipped this stuff around and heated the oil. And then you circulated this through your house. Uh, hello? You know? Okay. Part of the part of the problem we face in many cases with energy, people don't understand where energy comes from, where it goes. But another problem uh, was this little box. So in the late seventies, this little box was sold as an energy saver. You, you bought it uh, for about one hundred and seventy five dollars, and you plugged it into one of your sockets, right? and this was going to save energy. Now, what turned out to be in that box was a metal oxide barrister, an MOB. Does, any, does everybody know what an MOB is? Who doesn't know what an MOB is? All right, there's an honest man. Metal oxide barrister is sort of like a Zener diode, except it's made out of, out of uh, metal oxide. And it's used extensively in power systems as, as, as lightning arresters. Anyway, it, it's, a, it's a clamp of sorts. Right? So the claim was that this thing would just clip all of the spikes in the voltage coming into your house. And it's all those spikes that are causing you to have a high electric bill. <laughs> so I was called by the, uh, the attorney general of New Jersey who said, uh, you know, this thing has been advertised and people are buying it and some people are saying it doesn't work. And uh, can you take a look at this? So uh, I said, yeah, I'm sure it doesn't work, but I'll take a look at it. <laughs> so I got a couple of them. We took them apart in the laboratory, had to, had to dissolve all of the stuff that it was embedded in to come up with just as baristic. And of course, theoretically, it can't work, it didn't work. But that's not sufficient because New Jersey was going to take these folks to court. So they needed definitive experimental evidence that this didn't work. So I had to have a whole bunch of, of experiments done on this thing with data and everything to show that it didn't work. Um, and then I had to go down to, to Trenton, uh, which is just down the road right now. Yeah. I had to go to Trenton uh, to the court to testify. So I was testifying for two days uh, and um, uh, one of the lawyers looked at the document. They had my my notebook. Um, one of the lawyers looked at this notebook and he said, "Well, I see on this diagram, this wire goes over here like this, and then this one comes up here like this. So how can you say that they're connected together?" And I said, uh, "All those wires come together, and there's a great big wire nut." that ties them together. And the dependents were a couple of electricians and they were sitting on the side and they just held their head like this because of the attorney was just so stupid. And then I got that stupid. <laughs> yeah, the other question they asked me, at one, one point I, I said in the notebook, um, the, uh, uh, data is bad, have to go home or something like that. And uh, so uh, they asked me, why, why did you have to go home? I said, my, well, my wife was waiting for me at home. 
He said, so you're having marital problems. <laughs> so, so the one thing I learned, the one thing I learned about this experience was if you ever need a lawyer, get a good one. <laughs> Do not get an idiot. And there are a lot of them out there who are idiots. Um, anyway, let's proceed. Uh, so uh, actually, Constantinos uh, and Sukai uh, I showed this this morning at their presentation. Are they here? They're, yeah, yeah. Okay, this is this is an electric airplane known as Alice. Um, and the Cape Air, which is a uh, Cape Cod-based airline, um, was proposing that they were going to buy this and fly it. Now, the concept is really interesting. Uh, electric airplane, not something that I'm excited about, but nevertheless, people are working on it. The important thing to recognize is what's required here. Here are the specifications for that particular airplane. Its range is about 540 nautical miles, and if any of you know how to convert from nautical miles to statute miles, that's about 650 miles, 625. It can range a uh, speed of 240 knots. Um, the maximum takeoff weight is 6,300 kilograms. The battery, weighs 3,600 kilograms. It's a nickel metal cobalt lithium batteries. 60% of the maximum takeoff weight is taken up by the batteries. Uh, now, that's fine, except when you get where you wanna go, that plane has to sit there for, I don't know how many hours while they recharge that battery. Um, yeah, is it practical? Yeah, it's practical. Um, is it economical? Someday it may be. But this is one of the applications that is actually uh, being pursued in a number of different places. Let me show you another application that's really quite unusual. Uh, this is an electro-aerodynamic propulsion system. It uses essentially uh, plasma thrusters. Now, plasma thrusters are not new. They're used in spacecraft all the time. But this one is being explored, um, explored for terrestrial propulsion. Mm. Uh, this is one of my former graduate students, Yo He, who is working on this. Um, and essentially, there are two power supplies here. Uh, so it's a very important power electronic application. One of the power supplies is a high voltage, 4 kV. The other one, is a higher voltage, 80 kV. So you wind up with, up here there's a, a, uh, a dielectric battery discharge electrode where the plasma is generated. And then the collector down here, of course, um, the plasma goes down to the collector, provides thrust in the vertical direction. Um, interesting, does it work? Well, here I've got, whoops. Uh, let me back up. Okay, here I've got two videos, uh, if they work, um, that, uh, oops. If I can get, ah, okay, so this one, Oh, I want to go back one. Okay, okay. this is th there's a a glider here uh, that has no propulsion. Right, so you're going to see it fly. It's launched with a I don't know rubber band or something, a big rubber band. Oh. Oh, this is backwards. This is the one with propulsion. And you see it, it's, it's continuous. And they stopped it before it ran into the barrier. This is in the MIT gym. Let me show you what you should have seen first, which is the one without the propulsion. So, 
The, the point is not to show you the crash. The point <laughs> is that with the propulsion, that thing went five times further before they just stopped it, um, before it ran into the, this, the barriers. Okay, we have, of course, another application which everybody's familiar with is robotics. Uh, this was, this may not be so exciting for everybody at the time it was, oops, uh, very exciting. These are MIT uh, developed uh, cheetahs, robots. Whoops, simply done. Now it's all power electronics that's driving those motors at the joints. And it's impressive to the extent that you can control them so individually, you couldn't do that unless you had power electronics. So next, uh, I'm gonna show you a, uh, this, is, this is the experimental apparatus that Cockcroft and Walton used um, to split the atom back in 1932. Uh, when did they do it? 32 is it? 1932, I think it was. Uh, yeah, 1932. Um, this is, uh, I believe this is uh, cock down here in this little cell. There's Walton over here. Um, what this apparatus is, uh, in part, is a Cockcroft Walton multiplier. Now, how many of you have screwed with the Cockcroft Walton uh, 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 Cockcroft Walton Walton multiplier? Right. Um, a Cockcroft Walton multiplier is this. So you you have an AC voltage on the left, and at the right hand side you have a DC voltage eventually, and in this particular multiplier is a, uh, this is, I believe, um, multiplies by uh, four or two. Maybe this is a, no, this is a four, four multiply. This multiplies by four. So you've got Vs here, and you've got a DC voltage at the output, which is four Vs. And Cockcroft and Walton use that to generate 800 kV. Now, when they first decided to do this, they wanted to use switches for the diodes. Unfortunately, um, the switches that were available were triode vacuum tubes. They couldn't support the kind of voltage that they needed. And then they discovered that they could use diodes in this circuit. And of course, they're vacuum diodes. They're not semiconductor diodes. So it was, again, power electronics, but not semiconductor power electronics that allowed them to split the atom and win the Nobel Prize. And now this circuit is named in their honor. The fact is that this circuit was actually presented earlier by a German uh, named uh, uh, Reinecker. That's also known as a Greinecker multiplier, but more often it's known as a Cockcroft Walton multiplier because they won the Nobel Prize. And here you have what we do today in, in, in modern circuitry is to use semiconductor devices as the switches, uh, which allows you some degree of control, but it also allows you to build up very large um, conversion ratios. So, um, in fact, uh, somebody this morning had a conversion ratio that was, what was it? Somebody had a, in the presentations, had a very high conversion ratio. 48 to 1. Huh? 48 to 1. Or... 48 to 1, yeah. One so something. using voltage uh, uh, switch capacitor converter, which is what this is going to use. Now, now, the other thing that's very valuable about this is that you have this conversion with no magnetic components in here. All other conversion circuits have inductors and transformers and so forth. Those 
components are not amenable to integration. This is amenable to integration because you can make capacitors on silicon, you know, <laughs> like candy, right? Um, unfortunately, the conversion ratio is not highly controllable. So in some applications that require precise control, you've got to follow through with a very small, what we call magnetic converter that, that gives you the pre precision required uh, at the output. But it's a very powerful circuit metal. And a lot of people are working on getting this thing integrated as some of many these people are. Oops. Uh, so here's another uh, application that people are working on called the solid state transformer. Uh, the solid state transformer actually was originally proposed again by Bill McMurray in 1970. And uh, what, what you see here is AC voltage coming in, being converted to these, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, AC voltage coming in here, being converted to a higher frequency pulse, you see here. So you can use a small transformer and then being reconverted to a low frequency AC out here, basically demodulating this. Um, today, uh, here's one design, not a very practical design because of so many switches, but it's a cascaded design for a solid state transformer. You've got an AC coming in here, you convert it to DC. You've got a high frequency bridge, converts the DC to a high frequency AC. You've got a transformer that because it's high frequency is small, and relatively efficient. And then you, you uh, convert that back to DC through this bridge, and then you uh, convert it back to AC over here, right? So what, what's the deal with this? Well, uh, one of the, th this, is, this is my opinion about the best application for the solid state uh, transformer is to replace the pole pig now, the pole pig is a distribution transformer that you see on telephone poles, power poles, you know, um, that uh, uh, is, is basically oil filled. It's running all the time. It's running all the time in the sense that it's always got voltage on it. Now, if you've always got voltage on a transformer, that means you've always got core loss. So this thing is up there on the pole heating up 24-7. Furthermore, you can't control it. There's no control over that transformer. Some of them might have some top changes on them or something, but basically you can't control it. And there's no communication between this thing and the utility company. With a solid state transformer, if you could replace that with a solid state transformer, then you had control. When the load was, was low, you had no core loss because the voltage is no longer high on the on a, on a big transformer. Uh, you had the ability to monitor what the power flow was so that you could tell whether there was a problem at a, at a particular location. So you, you can imagine the kind of versatility that a solid state transformer would bring to the party in this particular application. Now, the problem is that this pole pig uh, is priced according to what it weighs. <laughs> Right? It's like meat, right? You weigh it or fish. You weigh it and uh, out comes the price because all it is is copper and iron. Oil, uh, well, of course, oil price is going up, but that's not the big issue here. Yeah. Copper and iron. What I just showed you as a cascaded solid state transformer, you can imagine costs a lot more than this. So, just like many of the power electronic applications, the requirement is, the challenge is that the cost be brought down. And we'll, we'll talk about that a, a, a little bit later. Um, speaking of transformers, let, let's go back to the New Orleans trip. <laughs> so I get down to the, to, to the chloralkali plant, which is a, a plant that, <clears throat> that manufactures chlorine using in, in a, uh, electrolysis process um, that requires, uh, you know, several hundred thousand amperes in vats of alkali uh, at very low voltage. 
sort of like 20 to 60 volts. Uh, so they've got um, a big rectifier sets in there. Uh, and uh, those rectifiers are also configured in such a way that the AC current on the primary side of the rectifier um, is uh, has a power factor that's very high. Now, how you do that um, is an interesting process. You should take a look at the first edition of power electronics uh, to see how that's done. Anyway, um, they had a problem. So every every Monday when they came into the plant, of course the plant shut down over the weekend. They come into the plant on Monday, they throw the switch to turn everything on, bang, circuit breaker trips. So what's the problem? They look around, everything looks okay to me. Uh, I say, okay, let, let's go out, let's take a look at the switch yard. So of course they've got a switch yard because this is a big load. Uh, we go out into the switch yard, there's a, the transformers and reactors and breakers and stuff in the switch yard. So we go into the switch yard and I look at the ground and the ground is littered with snakes. <laughs> so what's going on here? Well, it turns out that over the weekend, the snakes, you know, this is, this is Louisiana, right? Lots of snakes. So the snakes want someplace warm for the night. <laughs> so they crawl up onto the top of these transformers, wrap themselves around the bushings. <laughs> Time operators come in in the morning, they throw the switch, electrocute all these snakes, right? <laughs> so the ground is littered with snakes. Right. Problem solved. Uh, get rid of the snakes. I don't know how they did it, but that was a solution. Anyway, uh, let's proceed here. Um, so one of the uh, challenges of plasma etching, and one of Minji's students is working on this, one of the challenges with plasma etching is that the load, uh, the plasma, is a high, highly dynamic load. It, it's time varying, uh, it's, it's also nonlinear, and you're driving this with a power amplifier. So you have to match the power amplifier to the load impedance, which is rapidly changing. This is the, the conventional way of doing that. You have here, these are capacitors. I don't think many of you have seen capacitors like this. They're sort of like bread slicer capacitors. The, the plates can go in and out like this, right? And there are stepper motors here and over here that control the capacitors. And this is an inductor and this whole thing is a mechanical load matching network. Very slow to respond, got stepper motors. Um, not very efficient in terms of how well it, it tunes to the needed impedance. Furthermore, um, it generally requires linear amplifiers preceding it because you all, since the match isn't very good, uh, you have reflected power. And the reflected power can be absorbed by a linear amplifier, whereas a switching amplifier has a lot of difficulty with that. Right. So um, what, what my colleague uh, Dave Perrault and several of his students came up with is a uh, tunable network for pl plasma load matching. Um, and uh, the two students who, who worked on this are Anas Basami and Alex Jerkov. I think that that this is like a piece of jewelry, <laughs> they really. Um, but it it allows um, uh, it, it basically tunes using phase controlled capacitors. Now, what's a phase controlled capacitor? Well. If, um, if you have a capacitor and you put a switch across it, so, and I put a switch across it, and I use a duty ratio on that switch with some details about the control, 
you can control the effective value of that capacitor. So that's essentially what's done here, is that you control the, the, the effective value of that capacitor electronically, again, using power electronics, replaces the integrated, uh, the interleaved uh, bread slicing capacitor uh, and the uh, stepper motor drives. Very rapid response, almost perfect matching. Now you can use a switching amplifier, more power electronics. One of my favorites, <laughs> induction cooking. How many of you have an induction range at home? One, two, three, four, that's it? Does your range make noise? Yeah. The fan some, but a little bit from the oscillator. At max, it makes buzz. buzz, buzz. We'll come back to that. Uh, so um, induction cooking, actually induction heating, uh, has been a, a, a real uh, favorite topic of mine. Very early in my career, one of my first graduate students actually uh, did work on induction heating um, modeling. And I had another one, uh, actually, Jer Hurley, maybe some of you know Professor Hurley from uh, Ireland. Um, he, he built an induction heating system, basically a, a cooking, a, a stove top thing, <laughs> right? Coil, and we had a really uh, a thyristor, an SCR-based inverter to drive this thing at, at 10 kilohertz. It screamed, <laughs> really screamed. But it was great because I could take it to class. It was a circuit that was interesting to analyze. And I could take it to class and show them how this, this circuit could manifest itself in something that was tangible, useful. <laughs> And so I would bring a frying pan in with me, and I'd have a couple eggs, and <laughs> and and uh, you know I'd put a little oil in the pan, and I'd fry a couple eggs, uh, and everyone was excited about this. And then uh, I'd say, uh, and by the way, the class, my classes at that time were at nine o'clock in the morning. How many of you go to class at nine o'clock in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> anyway, it was nine o'clock in the morning. So hardly anyone had any breakfast. So I'd say, okay, who, who would like the eggs? <laughs> There's a mad scramble for the eggs. So we had to raffle off the eggs. No pun intended. Really <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, right. So uh, another um, call I got uh, again during the energy crisis in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, was from uh, one of the chief engineers at General Mills. They had a concern that they might be shut off from a gas supply. Now, they used gas uh, for a lot of their process cooking. So they asked me, could I do something to convert their system to electricity? Uh, so I said, well, maybe. Uh, what is the process? So they took me out to one of the plants um, in California, and it was a plant, uh, the, the, the particular process was for cooking Cheerios. Now Cheerios, many of you may not know, Cheerios is the best-selling cereal in the world. Um, so Cheerios are manufactured in, a, in, in a, about a 10 foot long pipe with a diameter of about 10 inches. Uh, that does the toasting, comes down and comes up. Uh, and it was gas fired and gas burners underneath this rotating pipe. So I said, I don't know how we can fix this. We can use induction heating. So I designed a system uh, to inductively heat the pipe. We had Westinghouse manufactured it, um, two big coils. Pipe was in the middle of it, um, was controlled by an SCR controller at the time, uh, and it worked fantastically. It generated, we could put more than 100 pounds of Cheerios a minute through this thing. Furthermore, um, previously, they had to pull the room this was in with big vent fans because of all the heat generated 
with the induction heating system, they actually had to bring heat into the room to prevent condensation. So all was great. So I went home. Uh, actually, it wasn't a one-day trip. It was multiple trips. But I went home thinking, oh, everything is great. A week later, I get a call from, from uh, the engineer. He says, John, I got a problem. He said, uh, the operators are calling this the death gun. I said, what? He said, well, we put a cage around this, and we had a sign on it that said, danger, high voltage. <laughs> so none of the operators would touch it because they were afraid of what it was. Totally mysterious, this thing with no flames, heating up the Cheerios, doing a great job. He said, uh, I'd, I'd like you to come out here and give a tutorial to these and the, these operators about how this thing functions and that it's not dangerous. I said, okay. So I went out there and they operate 24 seven, three shifts. So I had two days, I had to give three lectures to three separate groups of operators about why this was not a danger here <laughs> and why it was such a great thing. And at the end, um, they converted all of their systems, uh, their Cheerio systems in all of their plants uh, to an induction heating. Yes? Who was easier to convince the lawyers from earlier? Or the, What's that? The operators, the Cheerio, who was easier to convince the uh, lawyers from earlier or the Cheerio operators? <laughs> oh, well, the, the lawyers I was able to, well, you never convince the lawyers, right? I mean, they've, got, they, they've got their position. They're being paid for their position. They're not going to change their mind. Yeah. But it only took two days uh, to, to well, actually, I guess two days to to get the, the the jury to decide that they were guilty. And it only took two days, really, to convince the operators that mm -hmm. this thing was fine. It's no, no big problem. Okay, so that's my induction heating story. Oh, by the way, I just recently, like, last week installed an induction cooktop uh, in my kitchen. <laughs> but I haven't had a, had a that chance to do it yet. <laughs> all, all I've done is boil some water and cook some scrambled eggs on it. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's talk for a moment about the noise. That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, does anyone have any theory about how the noise arises? Yeah. I told the uh, informers uh, or have a bunch of coils that individually repel each other because of the oscillation of those repellent forces here and disappear. They vibrate against each other. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, that's not my theory anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have to say we haven't done any experiments yet, but but uh, Dave Parole, my colleague, uh, also has an induction range. His wife doesn't like the noise. So together, we're actually going to do some experiments <laughs> with some coils to actually, and an oscilloscope to look at the fields to see what's going on. But um, my theory is that, and Dave's uh, theory is that, that there's a DC voltage coming in, right? And that, that gets converted to whatever the frequency is, 30 kilohertz, 50 kilohertz. I don't know what frequency they use. Um, the rectifier that can that creates the DC voltage needs a filter. If they cheap on the filter, then the DC voltage actually has some ripple in it. That ripple is going to show up as a modulated 30 kilohertz or 50 kilohertz. Yeah. I'm going to offer it to you. You can actually see this in the raw. If you take a a cash register receipt tape, yeah. which is a thermographic paper, and put it between your pot and the induction burner and turn the burner on a little bit, you'll see exactly what you're talking about reflected in a pattern on the is paper. Is that right? That's right. <laughs> no, that's, I got to talk to you a little more about that. It sounds, sounds easier than an oscilloscope. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yeah. It's an empirical way to see the actual yeah. the wave action of the coil. So, so you've got this ripple. Uh, on the DC, which shows up as a modulation on the uh, on the uh, uh, high frequency, right? So here's a question for you: If that theory is correct, what is the frequency of the noise that you're hearing? 
That's to be lower. Yeah. That's to be to, lower than what? 10, 10 kilohertz or less. Oh, no, 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 no. The, the ripple. You wouldn't hear it otherwise. You, you wouldn't hear that, <laughs> right? So what's the frequency of the noise? I mean, the idea is now that this ripple on the output is showing up uh, as, as a variation in the force on the pan. So what's the frequency? Has to be in the acoustic range, right? Yeah, but yeah. You're hearing but, it. but I want a number. Okay, a quarter of what of the what frequency. 60? No. Well, that that's starting to get into the fine structure, but no. <laughs> the frequency, first of all, what's the frequency of the ripple? 30 kilohertz. What? 30. No, no, no. The, the, <laughs> The ripple, the stuff you don't want, was the frequency of the modulation on the high frequency. That's a much higher frequency, isn't it? Come on, you folks who do, doesn't any, hasn't anyone built a rect, full wave rectifier? Before you put the filter on a full wave rectifier, what's the frequency, uh, the fundamental frequency of the output? 120 hertz, right. Is that the frequency that you hear? No, why? It's too what? Too low. <laughs> it is low, but why do you hear a higher frequency? Because the 240 hertz is going to provide, uh, I'm sorry, the 120 hertz is going to provide a 240 hertz force on the pan. So probably if this theory is correct, what you're hearing is a 240 hertz uh, buzz. Now I've got to say that I don't hear the buzz, right? And one of the reasons I don't hear the buzz is because I don't hear very well anyway. So it doesn't make any difference. Anyway, this this is, if you go into an appliance store today and want to buy a cook range, your choices are almost all induction ranges. I don't know if anyone, I mean, you can buy a radiant range probably, but you're not going to have much of a selection, but you're going to have dozens of induction ranges. Okay, that was a long. All right. So, <clears throat> this is something else that uh, uh, Manos and Shukai uh, mentioned this morning. Uh, that is in integrating the electronics, the power electronics with a machine. This has been a, 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 a real goal for ages. Um, Tesla, I think, was the first to really manufacture a beautiful package that incorporated the silicon carbide power devices and the controls into uh, the drive uh, motor for their uh, Model 3. Beautiful, beautiful uh, example of packaging, beautiful engineering. Um, in fact, you know, Tesla's got some great engineers. Uh, so one thing Musk knows how to do is to hire good engineers. Um, the, you know, there's also, th th this is an example of how you might package something that comes from I got this from Tom Johns, um, also uh, was shown this morning. But I'd like to show you a, uh, <clears throat> uh, a a scheme that we're working on at MIT. This is it's quite a bit different. Uh, this is a one megawatt, twelve thousand RPM machine that's again designed for aircraft. But it's the aero department that's collaborating with us on this. Um, what you see here is, uh, it, it's, I mean, there's no machine here yet. This, this encompasses the electronics. The, the parts of the electronics are up here, I'll show you in a moment. Uh, and these inductors simulate the machines. The machine will actually be sitting out here. Um, and the reason is that the cooling for this, the, the, the machine actually has 
the stator is inside the machine and the rotor is outside the machine. And one of the reasons for that is that you can then cool by blowing air through the air gap between both the uh, rotor and the stator and continue the air through the electronics package here to cool the electronics. And uh, if you're in a, an airplane, there's a lot of air that can come through this. And, and here, here uh, is the uh, electronics for that. Uh, there are two boards. Uh, this is a, a top board and a bottom board that comprise um, uh, uh, e each there's, there's, each board has 20 silicon carbide FETs, 10 of them in parallel. Right? And the top and the bottom represent the top and the bottom legs of one leg of a bridge, top and the bottom branches of one leg of a bridge. Uh, this will have um, 10 three-phase bridges driving the motor. It's a very ingenious packaging scheme. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the in, our, our, our lab engineer who's helping work on this uh, has just done a magnificent job of, of designing and packaging this thing. Um, we will see uh, how well it functions. Um, but it's one of the, th the reason I wanted to show you this is because packaging is one of the primary challenges in power electronics. It's not just to get it small, but if you're operating at higher frequencies like this thing will be doing, you have to package in such a way that your parasitic inductances and your parasitic capacitances aren't killing you one way or another, either with over voltages or over currents. So it's a challenge. So let's talk about where things are going. Um, there's been advancements in semiconductors and you're all familiar with these. Uh, silicon carbide is now ubiquitous. Right? It's got a very high breakdown voltage. It's got superb thermal conductivity relative to silicon more than twice the thermal conductivity of silicon. And fortunately, the fabrication technology is similar to silicon. You can build vertical devices. The, 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 the um, wafers aren't as large yet as you can get with silicon, right, Greg? They, they, maybe you can get up to six inches, maybe eight inches in the near future. Yeah, right. but with silicon, you can get a dozen inches. And they're probably working, I'm sure, on 16 inches. Um, gallium nitride, uh, of course, is very high speed. The problem with gallium nitride is that it's a more co a complex fabrication process. The device has to be lateral, cannot be vertical. And the reason is because gallium nitride has to be deposited on top of silicon carbide and the device then manufactured on the gallium nitride. So you cannot go vertical. Uh, and of course, people are working on trying to develop native gallium nitride devices, but it's hard to make the gallium nitride in the thicknesses that are required to do that. Lastly is a super junction MOSFET. Um, it's got higher voltage ratings than conventional MOSFET and lower RDS on. And most people don't understand how that works. And I have to under tell you also, I am not completely in understanding about how this works, but I'm gonna show you at least conceptually how it works. So uh, here you have the geometry in, in, in this, this layer here, which is where you support the voltage when the device is off. Uh, you've got these narrow channels of, of lightly doped N and P regions. When a device is off, if you consider these N and P regions to be like PIN diodes, 
you're familiar with PIN diodes, but it's okay if you're not. Um, each of those PIN diodes uh, looks like this and has a, a um, uh, an electric field profile that looks like this, right? Because you've got positive uh, charge down here at this junction, negative charge up here. Uh, and uh, you've got the opposite over here. So when you bring these two together, you cannot have a discontinuity in the electric field at the point where they come together, unless you have an impulsive charge there. Maxwell's equations, which you don't. You don't have an impulsive charge there. Therefore, the potentials have to be identical uh, between the two. The result is something like this, where you have equipotentials all the way down the two columns, resulting in an electric field that looks like this. Well, the voltage is the integral of the electric field. So you can see that the integral of this field is much greater than the integral of either of these fields. That's the reason why you wind up with a much higher voltage. The other thing is that because, because these channels get completely depleted at a relatively low voltage, you can increase, you can increase the concentration of impurities in these channels, which increases then the conductivity of the channels. Right? The doping concentration can be increased. That reduces RDS on. So as a consequence, you wind up with a device that is really superior to the conventional FET. Okay, so quickly, uh, the power electronics timeline, the IEEE, um, we've looked at a little of this. Uh, the SCR was uh, invented here. 230.55 here, the um, uh, Power Electronic Society was created in 1988 uh, after a lot of, of diplomatic negotiations. Um, the last Power Electronic Specialist Conference was 2008, and there were greater than 850 papers. Just go back to the original conference, which was 20 papers. Um, in the 35th Applied Power Electronics Conference was in 2020, and I don't have the data for, for that or the, the latest APEC. Um, but APEC started here. This is the conference that finally got me to New Orleans. <laughs> and the reason it finally got me to New Orleans is because I was chairman of that conference. I could pick the venue. <laughs> so I picked New Orleans, and that's how we wound up in New Orleans. Uh, so where should the future foci be? First of all, manufacturing and packaging is absolutely critical to the commercialization of any power electronics stuff. The thermal challenge, especially as we get to smaller devices, a smaller, uh, com smaller, smaller packages, uh, the thermal challenge becomes really severe. It's got to have economic viability. Semiconductor devices, my recommendation is that you stay on top of them, know their capabilities and what their limitations are and know how to apply them, which isn't always obvious. Magnetics, there's a lot going on in magnetics, different materials. I mean, Minji's group is doing some phenomenal work on characterizing magnetics. I applaud them for that. Um, everybody's going to higher frequencies because it reduces magnetics. Uh, but you you know there's a certain frequency at which magnetic materials are no longer going to be viable, so you got to eliminate the magnetic materials. Um, again, there's thermal challenge. New battery chemistries seem to be, and uh, every once in a while somebody comes up with an idea for a new battery chemistry. Just stay on top of the new battery chemistries. Um, and, and batteries, as I say here, they're everywhere. Everything is portable now. If you don't have a portable power drill with lithium ion batteries, you're living in the stone ages. You need that. Recognize, envision new applications, you know, like, like Minji's group is doing with the, and Dave's folks did with the 
with the uh, impedance matching network using power electronics to, to replace the mechanical stuff. And lastly, think about how AI can be applied. AI, you know, we used to talk about neural networks then, and that was the big thing. Then came big data, that was a huge thing. Now we've got AI. You know, everybody's talking about AI, but most AI that people talk about is chat GPT. Okay. Mm -hmm. Who the hell cares, right? <laughs> I mean, it's really, really very fascinating. Chat GPT yeah. is great, but it's not where AI is really going to make an impact. It's going to make an impact, I think, in, in the case of power electronics in, in the area of control. Right? So think about that. And lastly, uh, <laughs> right. So, so you want to write a book. Let, let me give you just a couple of, of, of observations about our experience in writing this book. First of all, if you're going to write a book, textbook. I mean, you can write a novel all by yourself sitting in the woods. If you're going to write a textbook, I really recommend that you have a co-author, at least one co-author. And the reasons are twofold. Number one, writing a textbook is a lot of work. You have to organize it in a way that makes sense. You've got, you, first of all, you have to understand what it is you're writing about. And it's much easier to do that if you've got colleagues who kind of can fill in those things that you don't understand or that you can discuss issues with that are controversial or you, know, you just don't understand how to write this. Secondly, having colleagues means that you're obligated to keep working on the book so you don't disappoint your colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's, that's not funny because it's, it's really, really critical to stay motivated. And it's hard to do to stay motivated. And it, I, don't, I, I don't think I could have done either of those books if I didn't have colleagues working with me uh, in the writing of those books. Um, uh, you have to you, know, you have to dedicate time. My philosophy was every morning, sit down, write for an hour. Doesn't make any difference what you write. Doesn't make any difference if you don't write. You just dedicate some time to it. Now, for for the first edition of the book, what the three of us did was two of them weren't married. <laughs> right. So that eliminated one conflict. The other, the other, uh, I was married, but my wife was very understanding. In a, in the month of January, MIT had what was called an independent activity period, no classes. So the three of us would pack up our IBM computers, which had a five megabyte disk <laughs> that was a um and a printer, and we would head down to my house on Cape Cod. And we would stay there for three weeks doing nothing but, well, actually, we would do two things. We would write the book, and in the evening, we would have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I want to thank you all very much for your attention. I hope that, that this has been, uh, if, if not uh, educational, at least a little bit entertaining. And I really appreciate the hospitality that I've received here at Princeton. And especially I'd like to thank Minji um, and Jim. Is Jim still here? Jim, for, <laughs> for the hospitality. And Greg, for sure, the hospitality that I've received here. It's the first time I've been on campus, as I said. Um, and I, I think you've got a wonderful operation here. Thank, thank you, John. <laughs> I almost forgot. So, anybody have a birthday today? <laughs> no. no. Uh, does any have, close, have a birthday close. that's close to today? <laughs> When's your birthday? Tomorrow. 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 <laughs> Here's a birthday present. Cool. Wow. This is how John is doing. So, I will be benefiting from this a lot. Yeah, so uh, many of us teach here. We know put together one hour lecture takes like 10 hours, and put together one hour presentation like this takes 100 hours of thinking. Thank you, John, for a really all pleasure. Yeah. Sorry, I ran over. I <laughs> hope that I didn't run into anybody. <laughs> 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 
All right, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to stay. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, uh, sure. thanks for yeah, sure. right. uh, You got into one big gap semiconductors. Uh, what's the status of diamond right now? Expensive. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, Greg, I honestly don't know. I mean, people have been working on, on diamond, super wide diamond. Yeah. yeah semiconductor but uh, and, and and great thermal conductivity yeah uh, but i do not know what the status is like one of the e to or p doping is difficult or impossible yeah yeah that's it's, too it's like fusions you know always in the future yeah yeah <laughs> but people are working on diamond PPP not as aggressively is. as they used to be but uh, yeah yeah, we are. We have uh, colleagues at PPPL looking at how we fabricate uh, diamonds uh, with plasma okay. process. Any other question? Well, thank you very much. All right, thanks, everyone.